Okay, uh, welcome this afternoon. Let me introduce you Elena Schatzi. So she uh, obtained a bachelor and master in essence and then moved on to the US to Colombia and did a PhD there in 2010. And then in the same year already moved to ETH, became assistant professor there and is since 2017 associate professor, uh, is heading the or coordinating the computation science program at ETH. And as you can imagine, uh, numerous publications, citations, and so on, in uh, with a very growing, uh, strongly growing uh, tendency. So she is a very well distinguished researcher, also obtained an ESC starting grant on windmill smart monitoring inspection and life cycle assessment of wind turbines. And I guess we see an image of that here. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I'm very happy to have her here to both as a role model and also on a topic that is kind of relevant and related to our work in Merchant City and I'm looking forward to hear more about it. So the title is uh, Resilience of German Trains, um, not exactly, <laughs> could be, you could also probably tell about that, but uh, we're more looking forward to monitoring and decision support systems, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here and give you a bit of a feel of what we do at the Chair of Structural Mechanics and Monitoring at ETH Zurich. Before I start, I want to congratulate this program or these two programs because I think it's an excellent idea to have this kind of, a, I guess, a spotlight talk. For me, it was a great experience to spend almost the whole morning with uh, female researchers from your labs or actually students and researchers. So. I, um, I, th I think this, uh, this is an excellent setup and it gives us a chance for, you know, exchanging at all levels uh, because at the end of the day, you know, being a female academic is not always uh, easy. We're not very many <laughs> and it's good to exchange and share experiences and thank you for giving a platform for that. So congratulations. Uh, now I would like to go into the topic of today. Uh, of course, I am a civil engineer. And I will be discussing a bit on what we do for resilience from my point of view, which is linked to the aspect of monitoring. And the way in which we try to structure our approach to resilience uh, is by uh, examining structures and infrastructure systems as systems that are actually interconnected. Uh, they are actually uh, essential resources that are serving for connecting people, mobility, through mobility, uh, the transport of goods, so they are uh, the web of our societies, and it's obvious why such systems should be resilient. At the same time, these types of systems are what we would define as cyber-physical constructs, and the reason for this is because we're talking about physical systems that nowadays are increasingly instrumented, so they're usually sensing uh, telemetry and other types of information that are conveying a multiplicity of information about these systems as they operate, but also as they're exposed to different types of disruptive agents and hazards. And this gives us the opportunity to formulate a virtualization of these systems, a digital counterpart that is able to live in parallel with the physical system that is in operation and is able to give us information that can help us optimally manage uh, the system, uh, not only in terms of extremes, which is often mostly linked to the aspect of resilience, but also in terms of optimal operation. So I will explain a bit on this. And I will explain it from the perspective of structural health monitoring, which is the discipline, let's say, that I am uh, serving. And in the structural health monitoring approach, uh, we have a few steps to uh, trying to tackle these cyber physical systems. And the first step is the acquisition of data, which today is becoming more and more um, uh, feasible. It is also becoming more affordable because we have lower cost sensing systems that can be attached, they can remotely um, be used to extract information about the behavior of a structure, a machine, at any scale really, even for large-scale large, large scale civil structures. And usually for us uh, in the discipline of structural health monitoring, the scope is to use this data for extracting information about the condition and performance of the system. And when you do this for the existing condition of the system, we're speaking of diagnosis, or when you do this for understanding how this system can perform and behave in the future under new stressors, we're talking about prognosis. So both of these aspects are essential to quantify, and oftentimes, uh, a, a more meaningful way to do this quantification 
is to fuse this information that comes from sensors and other inspection sources with models, engineering models that are driven from first principles, principles of mechanics in our case, or dynamics, or principles that are underlying whatever is the discipline you're working with. The idea is to try and fuse these engineering models with data to strengthen the information that can be conveyed. And in the end, we hope that we are able to lift this information and the indicators that come out of this assessment loop into the management of systems or networks or fleets. And so you can imagine that we are uh, monitoring individual components, such as wind turbines, as was mentioned before. But at the end of the day, we want to improve operation at the fleet level, at the level of the wind farm or the level of the assembly of wind farms in the North Sea, for instance. So to do this kind of a process, I will discuss different levels of augmentation, as I call them. And this is why the talk is titled Augmented Twins, because we consider in my group twins to be multi-layered systems that require a perspective that is, uh, let's say, an assimilation of different steps. And the first step is, of course, getting the data itself is the most obvious step. So here I'm showing you a few of the domains of activity of our chair. Basically, where does data come from for us? And we have uh, monitoring um, activities in collaboration with the Swiss Federal Railways. For, for, for instance, we're treating data that come from sensors that are deployed on vehicles that are traversing the infrastructure network. We care here about both understanding the performance of the vehicle, but mostly the infrastructure, what is the condition of the track or the ballast or the substructure that is being traversed. We have a number of activities, as mentioned earlier, on wind energy monitoring. So you see here actually a wind turbine that we own as a living lab, not too far from our campus, which we use as a prototype for inflicting different types of performance uh, um, criteria, different types of damages, and testing new technologies somehow. Um, and then we also have, as civil engineers, traditional activities in monitoring of buildings and bridges, which are critical, safety critical, uh, of course, infrastructures, but also machine components for us are structures as well. So we also have activities in monitoring engines or other types of industrial assets. All of these are for us uh, entities that can be explored through the uh, use of sensors and can be understood through this principle of structural health uh, monitoring. Now, in order to uh, give you a glimpse as to what one can do with data, which at the end of the day is a lot, uh, I will start from this level. So we're trying to use data to understand the performance of systems. And here I'm showing a quite famous image of a wind farm, where you see the evolution of the wake effect, which is basically the influence that the four front-facing turbines have to those that are downstream uh, along the direction of the wind. And the wake is basically the increased turbulence here that you see that not only uh, affects power production, because it affects the velocity that reaches the uh, turbines in the wake of those uh, that are in the front row, but it also affects uh, performance of these turbines from a structural point of view and compromises their lifetime because uh, you have a higher uh, you have a more uh, complicated type of loading that reaches these systems, which is increasing fatigue and therefore uh, compromises their operation. So here in wind farms, the good thing is that we have quite a lot of data in the form of what is called SCADA data. They're averaged at 10 minute intervals, but they are actually very rich information about the wind velocity orientation, but even loads. So what is the moment experienced by these wind turbines uh, at the level of the nacelle, the top of the turbine? And what we did was to try and develop a data-driven model. In this case, we use a conditional variational autoencoder to take information from a meteorological mast somewhere in the wind farm and translate it into a model of what is the wind velocity speed, but even engineering critical quantities like fatigue and wind deficit uh, that is induced by a main orientation of the wind in the farm. This is a predictive model, which is trained on, on data, obviously but which can be translated into engineering in formative quantities that can be used for the design of these systems, including reliability or uh, resilience analysis and so forth. Now, up to this point, we haven't really had to use 
an engineering model of the system, which is the nice thing. At the same time, you should realize that we're only learning a prob probabilistic model of what the data conveys. It's a nice model because it doesn't, I don't have to use an empirical model or some sort of physics-based complicated uh, CFD code to take this information, but uh, I'm only predicting or seeing what I have really been observing from data in the past. Now, another thing that we can very well do just from data is to extract indicators of the condition of the system. For instance, if I have sensors on the tower of this wind turbine, usually I can use them to understand the dynamic response of the turbine, because the easiest type of sensor to use tends to be an accelerometer. And because I have a good uh, knowledge of dynamics, here I could fit a model which is not necessarily uh, a, a physics-based model, but it's still a structured model of what I expect the dynamics of the system to be. For example, wind turbines tend to be what we call time-varying systems. If you look at their spectrum, you would see that over time, the spectrum is not constant, so they don't have fixed frequencies, but frequencies that modulate over time. And there exist methods that are data-driven that can very well describe this phenomena. So we work with these methods, and we additionally try to see if we can condition our predictive models to the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that these systems are exposed to varying environments. The wind direction and speed will tend to vary depending on the season, the temperature as well. And so we have to condition our, let's say, structured dynamics models to these influences. So this is something, again, that can be done in a completely data-driven way. There are many options that we have experimented with and many more that others have tried. And it turns out that you can build such a predictive model of the system. And if you compare what you predict to what you measure, it is also possible to extract data-driven condition indicators, which is great because, again, no real physics has to come in the loop and we can do something very useful. We can check if there's damage uh, onto the system. So how do we check and report it? Well, we can do charts that show if the system is in a green behavior, or everything is going as expected. If there is an alarm because we have an abrupt behavior of the system in an area that we have sufficient data to be confident about our prediction. Or maybe we should be issuing a yellow alarm because suddenly we have data of new <laughs> wind speed and direction information. And so we're not very confident about our model. We're picking up something wrong, so we need to check what's going on. And that's the kind of information we give to engineers usually, a red, amber, green sort of alarm system for diagnostics. We can do the same in bridges, and we have done it, and we have shown that if you have a distribution of sensors on the bridge, you can even go a step further, and you can say, oh, I don't only pick an alarm, so I know something is wrong, I can go a step further and tell you more or less where the, the damage is because of the distribution of the sensors in the network. And that's also great, but up to this point, all I have been doing is diagnosis. So I can pick up outliers and abnormalities, and that's pretty much all I can do. I cannot tell you how the system will behave. If there is any more refined information you wish from me, I will not be able to deliver this very easily. And the reason for this is because some of some of the known pitfalls of data-driven models. And now I know that many of you come from different backgrounds, and I expect that all of you have fallen into the trend of AI. So probably you are aware of these uh, known pitfalls. The fact that if you train a data-driven model, it's not necessarily an interpretable model that you are fitting in some sort of uh, data. It's lacking physics unless you have found a way to fuse it in, but the purely data-driven model is lacking physics and therefore it's not easy to explain or to extrapolate beyond the range for which you have trained it or beyond the range that you have observed. If you would like to look at it in a more sort of metaphorical way, I like to use this uh, proverb of the six blind men and an elephant, which is a Chinese proverb. And here you see the situation where if we have someone just feeling parts of the complete landscape, you're probably going to formulate a completely wrong <laughs> impression on what it is you're feeling or what it is you have trained on. So when the reality is an elephant, maybe you think it's a snake, a tree, or a wall, but it's only because you have only blindly examined uh, a very narrow area. 
So the issue is for us, for uh, uh, people that are into diagnostics and prognostics, is a very severe problem. And the idea is how can we actually try to move past it? And that's where it's very useful to go back into your fundamentals and remember what it is you learned, in my case as engineers, which is actually some sort of physical intuition into the uh, system that you are exploring. And so the suggestion is to try and capitalize on knowledge, on the physics that you know, as a positive inductive bias, as we would say it, into the learning of the system. And I, I would like to therefore explain how to do that. In other words, how to move from purely data-driven representations, which have been shown to excel in diagnostic tasks, but basically are only giving you a reflection of the image of the system in the area in which it has been trained, to representations that can extrapolate. So if you would like them to extrapolate, they would have to have some physics into the simulation loop. If you put, and, and this is something that we as engineers can very well do. Actually, the very first thing you learn as a student is how to simulate systems. That's the first knowledge you get. And in fact, if you would like to think of it in the terms of digital twins, which is also something um, that I uh, referred to up to now, when you simulate a system just purely based on physics, we can also, of course, think of this as a twin of a real model, but we would call it a digital twin prototype. It's a twin that has not been verified by data. If you would like to get the best of both worlds and finally move from diagnosis to prognosis, then you could think of joining physics with data in what is, is called hybrid modeling. And that's what, a bit of what I would like to discuss today. Hybrid models are basically models that have physics principles and at the same time have a verification and validation from data that is extracted from a cyber physical system in order to construct a digital twin representation that is a continuous representation of the system and is what my colleague Sharbel Farhat refers to as a digital twin aggregate which is a term I also very much like because it's a twin that is continuously updated through data received over the whole life cycle of a system. And one step further, if you're in control or you want to do fast diagnostics and you want to do these kinds of tasks in real time, this updating of the digital twin in real time, you want to go to the construction of these real time digital twins, which are non-trivial, however, to obtain. So let's discuss a bit on this. How can we get physics in the loop, but in a way that is affordable for us to do the simulation? And physics can come in the loop through two different uh, main sources. The first is through modeling hazards and stressors, so loads onto your system. Of course, meteorological models and climate change models are good examples of how you can use this, uh, this kind of uh, bias to anticipate the change of the loads or stressors in a system. But perhaps the most interesting aspect for us is the physics that governs the behavior of a structure itself because this can be key to uh, predicting the performance of the system, to discussing how it will perform in the case of extremes, which lies at the core of resilience uh, as a metric. Now, a good example that I'm featuring here is what you would do, for instance, if you would like to fashion an early warning system for earthquakes, which is something we do when we monitor buildings. An earthquake is, of course, an extreme event. And while it is not possible to claim that you can monitor all of the buildings uh, that are existing in a city and do data-driven indicators, what it's possible to claim is that you, if you have both data and a model that is representative or models that are representative of uh, uh, your city scale, let's say, stock, uh, then you can combine the two in order to extract fast metrics that can help those that inspect these critical, uh, these, these buildings after an earthquake, uh, can guide them to rapid loss assessment, to tagging or flagging of buildings as inappropriate for uh, inhabiting or uh, deeming uh, repair, repair works and so forth. Um, I'm not going to discuss that particular project. Here I would like to discuss more of the framework that you can use to do this fusion of the models and the data. And I would like to actually discuss the most challenging case, in my opinion, which is the real-time twin. And what does a real-time twin have to do? It has to be able to model complex behavior of the system. For instance, for us, if we're talking about long blades or very high towers, it can be nonlinear dynamics, actually, that is governing the system. 
it is operating under environmental and operational conditions that are changing, changing winds and temperatures and loads. The excitation, the load of the system is usually not easy to measure or quantify because it's distributed. Uh, wind is a distributed load, traffic is a distributed load, all of them we can claim that to some degree we can measure them, we can never perfectly measure them, but we have to anticipate that they exist and describe them. And then we have to fuse data with some sort of model of the system in real time, which is almost an impossible task if you do it traditionally. Why would, we, uh, why would we like to do this? Well, because I want fast diagnostics, I want a fast virtualization of the system if I'm an engineer somewhere trying to visualize what's going on. Uh, maybe I want to use it for control. And in general, what I would like to deliver is basically a system where I have virtual sensors in locations where I'm not measuring. I want to see what is the performance of the entire uh, structure. This is what a proper twin is, performance of the full field system, not just by looking at what I measure and extrapolating on that, but really understanding how the system performs as a whole, which is what I call doing everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> this is the task I want to explain, where we typically have a structure, it's a wind turbine, maybe it's a bridge, maybe it's a car that we're monitoring with few sensors because our budget is specific and you never can claim that you can monitor everything on a system. Usually we have some accelerometers or strain gauges as typical examples. And we have some unknown loads that are acting onto the system because most of the time we cannot measure them very easily. And as engineers, we're also in the pleasant situation to have, to have access to some sort of model of the system, which, however, is never perfect. I mean, most of the times uh, we try to monitor systems that have existed for years, or they're so complex that even if we have some approximate model, it's never a perfect model. Uh, at best, it's a good model with unknown parameters that we have to define. And what we would like to do is to extract the response of the system not in a single uh, location, but as densely as possible. So I would like to extract pretty much everything. I would like to get an updated view of the characteristics of the system. I would like to do it everywhere in all possible degrees of freedom and locations of the system under the challenges of uncertainty, um, non-linearity, so complex behavior, limited observations, large dimensional, meaning complex systems, and if I want to do it in real time, I want to do it all at once. So here is the problem definition. And I would like to break it down into pieces. The very first thing I want to do is model the system for all of these complexities. But, and, and in my, my group, we, we really uh, have a lot of activities on this. We even teach um, finite element uh, courses where we explain how you can simulate a structural system. But the problem is all of these options are never fast enough, fast enough to be combined with data. So we need to come up with a way to reduce our engineering models in order to make them appropriate for use with data that is dynamic, that is obtained at fragments of a second. And so you have to, you have, to have something that computes at a fragment of a second. One way to do this, which is quite popular, is to use what we call a surrogate. And there are many ways to build a surrogate. Uh, a surrogate is a model of the system that tries to obtain the same response or the same prediction as the original model, but in a faster way most of the time. Um, so for, for example, one way uh, that we have experimented with this is to have an initial very heavy model, computational model of the system, for us usually a finite element model, for others, a computational fluid dynamics model. And we basically uh, conduct a number of simulations, up to n simulations from the system, which we use to train, indeed, such a surrogate. Um, one way to do this is to use a, what is called an autoencoder. It's basically a representation that brings your original system into a, into a much more reduced space, where uh, in this space we have shown that also the system behaves like a dynamic system, like the system we monitor. And then we try to use um, a, essentially a numerical integrator, in this case an LSTM, which is another type of neural network, to go from a prediction of the response of the system at time t to the next point in time. And we do this sequentially, but we do it in this very low dimensional space. But the benefit of using such an autoencoder is that we can use the decoder module to go back to the original physical system. 
And this is actually absolutely imperative for us because the behavior, what we measure, is in that physical system. I cannot get away with using toy parameters or reduced parameters for the whole time. I have to have a way to come back into this original uh, space. Uh, and this is something we have actually implemented on real systems. We were discussing about this before, but we have a collaboration with Siemens Gamesa, for example, and they are interested in understanding how to reduce uh, the simulation time for their models uh, of uh, the non-linear problem of a wind turbine, which is on a soil foundation. The behavior on the soil foundation is extremely is non-linear, so it looks like these curves. These are not linear curves. And if they try to do a dynamic analysis of this system, it takes actually, it could even take several hours, and we have to do it in fragments of a second, uh, if we want to combine with data or if we want to give it to them for use for reliability analysis. So this is what we did. We used the logic that I showed before to come up with a surrogate which is significantly reduced, so it does the computation of the system in uh, much lower than what we call real time, um, essentially doing uh, 400 seconds of simulation in seven seconds at the end of the day. So it's something that we can now use with data. Well, whilst the, the original model is something that is unfit for use with uh, data. So this is a bit of the problem we're trying to tackle, but uh, there are also some difficulties for us, even though this seems to work very nicely. Um, it is not very easy to generalize for different types of problems. So we, we managed to represent this wind turbine the specific geometry and replace it with a surrogate, but it starts becoming more difficult when I want to do everything. And when, when I say everything is to represent the system for different parameters, for different heights of the tower, different lengths of the blade. In that case, I have to come up with what is called a parametric reduced order model, a model that where I can flexibly change the configuration of the system and the loads and still come up with a very fast prediction. And a good way to do this, at least for us, and for our applications is to use what is called a projection-based reduction method. I won't go into the details of this, I'll just show you how it works for us for a very typical civil engineering structure, which is a shear frame building. It has nonlinear behavior, which is very, uh, again, typical and expected for us at the joints. It presents what we call hysteretic behavior, so it's a behavior that is nonlinear. Um, and if you have multiple such joints, as you do here, it suddenly becomes a very complex problem. In fact, we have offered it for those interested as a benchmark example for testing your reduced order modeling capabilities. This is for the communities that uh, are very interested in reducing computation for such problems. And so what we did is we tried to build a reduced order model that can predict the dynamic response of this building for different properties of the material different properties of the hysteretic hysteresis of this of these joints and different properties of the excitation the load that is acting on the building which is earthquake so different types of earthquakes um, and to do this what we uh, ended up uh, going for is again to start from the, our original physics right that's what i claim throughout the talk that we're engineers we have models we want to use them <laughs> so this is the full order model of the system it is, in this case, an ordinary differential equation that is non-linear. It has multiple degrees of freedom. It takes hours to solve uh, normally, or maybe you can do your magic on high-performance computing and it could be a bit less. For those who work with, uh, in other fields, you can imagine that this could be a PDE, a partial differential equation uh, describing uh, diffusion or other properties. It doesn't matter, as long as you have an equation that is dynamic. Um, and which you can use to generate what we call snapshots, basically the response of the system for some realizations of the parameters. So for different material properties or inputs of the load, I can run my simulator and I can get the results of the response that I would like to be able to predict. If you can do that, then you can build what we call a parameterized reduced order model. Um, and this is possible uh, by using uh, essentially a singular value decomposition. It's a mathematical operation that is operated on the response matrix that you generated, but which allows you to use an equation that has R degrees of freedom and is much lower than the original uh, dimension N. The reason why it's, this is very useful for us is because this equation is still an equation with physical connotation. It's still more or less the physics you started with. In our case, an ODE that is non-linear. 
and which we can now solve for different values of the parameter space, different properties of the uh, load and different properties of the structure. Um, there are many ways to do this representation. Um, some try to do a generation of different, as I said, snapshots and then interpolate between them. We don't find that works very well or is not maybe as elegant as having a continuous representation. So one of the things we did is we tried to express the reduction basis of the system, which was the tool that took us from the multi-degree of freedom equation to the reduced equation. And we use a variational autoencoder to express a dependence between the parameters of the problem and these reduction bases. And now we have a more smooth way to interpolate or produce our reduced model. What does this mean? It means that if I have different values of, for example, the forcing that is acting of, on this uh, building, maybe it's the amplitude of the earthquake or the frequency content of that earthquake, I can generate or approximate the response of the system using my reduced order model. I can do it in fractions of time, actually much better than real time. And of course, I will have varying precision because it's still just an approximation. But usually, we can achieve a precision that is acceptable for us, uh, acceptable enough to be used as a twin, a surrogate, or a, a virtualization of the system. So until now, I have been trying to compute fast. I have not yes, yet used data, uh, but let me show you. So actually, before I do that, this is what the prediction would look like. This is the true uh, simulation that takes a long time to compute um, in black. And then you have the prediction in the mean of the prediction in uh, orange. And the good thing, because we use a variational autoencoder, it's a bit of a detail, but the good thing is that it's a stochastic model, so I can also get the variance of my prediction. So I have a prediction, a quantified um, confidence on how much I trust the prediction of my model, and I would like to fuse it with data. And so this is where things start becoming probably interesting or confusing. <laughs> so uh, when you try to mix model with data, there exists a number of different approaches that you can use. In fact, there exists what we claim to be a spectrum of approaches. And the spectrum of approaches depends on how much you rely on a model, so how high up you're on this vertical axis, and how much you want to rely on data, which is the horizontal axis of this uh, spectrum. Depending on how much you rely on a model, you could be starting from a white box approach using models that you completely trust. They are completely transparent. You know the structure and the physics. Or you could be slowly losing your confidence in these models and you start fusing also some information that is learned from data. You go to gray box models, to intermediate areas of the spectrum, up to the point where maybe you completely lose confidence in the model, you throw it away and it's a black box uh, that you're using. It's purely learned from a data representation. Okay, So I would like to explain this kind of mixing starting maybe from the case where you have a good model of the system, which is though not perfect. So we're not up here, we're somewhere here, a bit more down. And this is what we call a Bayesian uh, filtering type of approach. It's an approach where you fuse a known structure of the system, which you admit may have modeling errors or measurement discrepancies from the data you measure. Um, and so there is one equation that represents the dynamics of the problem probably gotten for us from the reduced order models I explained before. And there's one equation down here, y, that represents the data of the problem. So here's the model, and here's the data that you measure, and here are the uncertainties. There is an uncertainty of the data because they're not perfect, they are not extracted from all degrees of freedom of a system, all areas of a system, and the model is also never perfect. But it's good enough, and it's a transparent form. So we're going to use it here. And we're going to try and predict the dynamic response of the system using this model and data. The first thing we can use is the equation. The equation can be the reduced order model that I showed before, and it will take you from an initial position of the problem, maybe your wind turbine at time t, to a prediction of where it would be at time t k plus 1, given a specific load. But because the model is, of, of course, flawed, I have to check what the performance of the model is by comparing the actual prediction of this model in the measurements, in the measured degrees of freedom, maybe accelerometers at the top of the turbine, with respect to the data. If this discrepancy is big, 
I will try and weigh it in my prediction in order to get a posterior of the system, a posterior estimate that is improved with respect to the initial uh, estimate. So in both of these cases, I'm fusing physics because the equations that connect data uh, to the um, state of the system is actually um, are actually uh, driven from such a, from such physics. So this is always a constant balance I'm trying to achieve, and the way in which we achieve it in Bayesian filtering is by using Bayes formula. For many of you, this could be something you have come across. It's a defining, let's say, framework for balancing observations or measurements with uh, predictions. So this is, to get back to our original problem, this is what we're trying to solve. Virtual sensing, digital twinning, presenting uh, predictions from a monitored system everywhere uh, to estimate the response of the system. Sometimes we do it to estimate both the response and the parameters of the problem, that's possible. Sometimes we do it to estimate the response of the system we measure, but also the loads that are unknown. That's an input state uh, case. Or you can be trying to actually estimate all of these together, a problem that can quickly become ill-posed, but if you have the right observations, could be solved, which is for us the interesting thing. So let me show you an example so we can concretize what uh, I mean so far. I'm using an example from a project we had for monitoring of aerospace systems in this case. And so here the objective is to use a fuselage, so the, the part of the aircraft, um, which is almost like a shell structure, that is where the cabin of the passengers essentially is, and we assume that maybe there is a, a flaw. Usually flaws on such thin shell structures come like, appear like cracks, and it could be not just one, but multiple such cracks. And we would like to see if we monitor the system in these red locations using some sensors, like strain sensors that you, or accelerometers that you could consider eventually embedded in these uh, um, fuselage structures, uh, whether we would be able to predict a crack, identify where it is, and whether we would be able to produce a twin of the system that anticipates or predicts response also in unmeasured uh, locations. So one way uh, to do this, again, is to go back to our basics, check what would be the model of the system that we would use. Uh, in our case, we would use something called extended finite elements to, prop to model cracks on a system which is very slow, so I need to then use a reduced order model to bring the computation down so I can fuse it with data using the filter I showed before. This is a non-trivial problem because cracking uh, basically means that every time you model the system, you have to take the crack into account. There is a detail here that I will not stick too long on, but basic, we have to have a basic manipulation that will allow us to have the same number of degrees of freedom uh, for different types of cracked geometries. And that we can do, again, using structural mechanics principles. And what it means is that I can simulate the vibration of that thin plate when it's healthy, no crack, or when it is cracked with multiple cracks. And I can do this simulation, again, in real time, so actually faster than what this video, uh, in fact, would show you here. So now I have a model that computes fast, and it's time to fuse it with the data, so I can build that filter. I take the model equations, I can bring them in this form, which is called a state space form, for those who may be familiar with that. And I can also assume that the input or loading to the system is unmeasured or unknown. Uh, that's possible to do. In that case, I have to use some sort of probabilistic model of the input, and then I can feed it into these Bayesian filters that I explained before, where all that we're trying to do is to estimate the response of the system given observations. And we try it for different parameters that are maybe the crack positions, the orientation and location within the structure. And in the end, I select the best performing model, and I hope that this gives me a convergence to the true uh, flaws. And indeed, this is what we show here. This is a simulated, of course, example but we have shown it also for actual tests. It's just easier to demonstrate it uh, in something that we have full control on. So here we start from a guess on where, how many and where the flows on the system is. And as the estimation continues over some seconds of simulation, you can converge to the actual flow location. But also interesting f interestingly for us, because we're in the business of making twins, we can also predict the response of the system in any other location. Um, with quite good precision and at fractions of the time required for uh, full order finite element models. So we can do it fast and by fusing the data we can also do it in a quite a successful way. We can anticipate 
the response of the system and even try to see where flaws exist. So we took that framework, which was simulated, and we put it on real uh, structures. This is a project with Siemens Gamesa. This is a monitored blade. This uh, has been treated by one of our recently uh, defended doctoral students, Silvia Vettori. She took this principle of mixing data and models using Bayesian filters, and she delivered an app uh, together with her colleagues in Siemens, who did a lot of the visualization, I should say. She delivered an app that uses the filter uh, I showed, more or less, an augmented Kalman filter, and gives the engineer a visualization of what the strains on the system are as it operates and as it is being loaded, just with output-only information, just response measured in few locations by accelerometers, you can get the full field image of the operation of the system. You can use this for different downstream tasks, such as diagnostics or prognostics, and eventually calculation of metrics that relate to resilience. And this is more or less the pipeline we're struggling to put together in a way that is realistic and exploitable by <laughs> engineers. So now we're trying to do this also with some of the startup uh, firms that came out of our group. Uh, one doing this uh, on building structures, Irmos Technologies, and RTDT Labs that is in the business of trying to close this loop for wind turbine structures. Now there is, however, a problem in closing the loop. And the problem is this reliance that I said on models. Oftentimes the models we have are not that great. We're not in a position to have models that are very accurate, especially if you have, for example, very complicated effects in the response of a system. You can try, and if you're a good engineer, maybe you get close to the prediction of the system response, but oftentimes there's something that is missing and we cannot uh, claim to know uh, beforehand. So when this happens, you have to stop relying so much on your model. You have to start moving a bit down into the gray area or the middle of the spectrum so that you can also start learning from data. And that's something we're pursuing, uh, particularly with our group, the portion of our group that is based in Singapore, working in the Future Resilient Systems Lab, where I understand many of the PIs here may have uh, also a knowledge of this, uh, of this program. And there, we're developing what we call physics-enhanced schemes to close the gap between the physics that we know and the real physics that is underlying a system. There are three different ways we found uh, we, we prefer to group these methods into. Of course, many other ways exist. Uh, we try what we call physics-guided schemes, where we try to force part of the physics that we know into the system. I'll show a bit on this later. We, do, we try physics-encoded schemes. In this case, we're using neural network architectures that are inspired by formulations of dynamics and physics. Uh, meaning the architecture itself is actually something that facilitates, uh, for example, differential equation solving, or physics-informed schemes, where again physics can come in the loop, but as a looser defined constraint. For example, a constraint that tells you that your systems are Hamiltonian, that there must be preservation of energy or that there is a specific dissipation of energy, or systems where you have the equations of your problem fed in, like pins, for instance. So we experiment with all of these um, aspects, but at the end of the day, what we want to capture is this model mismatch, the discrepancy between what we know, which is a simple maybe model of the system, and what is really there, which is something additional, maybe something nonlinear that you're not aware of. Maybe it's a dissipation of energy that is not really fitting our conventional approach to dumping estimation, for instance. This is very common. Because dumping, for example, is just a construct of the engineers. It's not necessarily the exact mechanism of energy dissipation in the system. So when that happens, you can superimpose what you can predict with your partial knowledge of the system and what you can learn. This is a very simple academic example to make this point. Here we're using a deep Markov model, which is actually a deep filter. It's the same logic as what I showed before. Uh, which tries to learn from images of a pendulum. Uh, it tries to predict the displacement of the pendulum in an accurate way, which is easy, even for black box methods like the DMM. The displacement you can get quite well. But additionally, we would like it to learn also the velocity of the pendulum, another state, another physics-related quantity that is important for engineering. Unless you, you, you fuse some knowledge of the pendulum equation into the problem, even if it's the simple linear equation, you cannot get this good prediction of that second qual uh, quantity of interest, which was velocity. 
And there's a reason for that. If you go as a black box model, all you learn is what you observe. In a video of displacements, you observe the displacements. There's no reason why your black box model should learn velocity. You never told it that you care about the derivative. And that's all we're saying here. If you care about the derivative, then just simply use the physics that defines this derivative, and you will get an improved estimation. This is an academic example. We also tried it in more complicated experimental situations. I will not go over this because it's a bit too much detail, but I would like to show you uh, the application of this for a specific problem. And this problem is what we call drive-by monitoring. I mentioned a bit of this in the beginning. You could imagine you have sensors on vehicles or on trains, and they are traversing roads and railway infrastructure, and you're collecting information that is low cost from these sensors, like from accelerations at the axle boxes. They look like this. They're an indirect measurement of the interaction of the train and the substrate, and you would like to get a condition indicator of the infrastructure itself. How good are the roads? Is a bridge being traversed that is actually damaged? These are the things that we care for, and that we try to solve both in Singapore and in uh, Switzerland, where Hara that you see there is working on this indirect drive-by assessment. And the principle we use is not too different from what I said before. You can have a simple model of the system, in this case the vehicle, and you can learn what remains from what you can model in the reality using a neural network uh, learner, for instance. If you, then if you can do that, it turns out that there is an optimal mixing that can allow you to actually use accelerometer information and infer the roughness of the road surface. Or in other work, we have shown that you can also infer the dynamics of a bridge, for example, that is being traversed. And so in the beginning in Singapore, we were trying to do it by instrumenting specific vehicles. We had a collaboration, or we were using the vehicle of the MIT team over there, which has a number of sensors actually deployed. But uh, what we ended up doing is something a bit different with the Future Resilient Systems Lab. Uh, we thought about using simpler platforms, where we use sensors that you can put together even with students, like a Raspberry Pi, using accelerometer and GPS modules, and transmitting this simple information into some sort of base station, where it can be taken so that it can be mixed with the models I showed, or other type of more refined classifiers, so that it can derive uh, different types of indicators of performance. But instead of using vehicles, for example, we uh, experimented with using simple robots, because these kinds of robots could be claimed to also autonomously drive over the shoulders of a bridge, for example, which is something we would like to do, and also bicycles. Uh, so we tried to put that platform also on bicycles, and this is a, a simulation of the bicycle path in Singapore, where we would like to then feed this information and extract indicators of the conditions of the uh, cycle pathways, uh, using indicators that, again, follow a classification system. So you have green for when you have good operation, or possibly then orange, uh, red, or other markers for the case where you have bumps, holes, and other types of instances that we, we classify using um, an SVAE, a specific uh, classifier in that case that works on the vibration data. And now, in closing slowly the talk, I would also, I would also like to uh, explain the other layers of augmentation. I talked about data and models, but not a lot of it is meaningful unless you have also the input and the feedback of the expert users of these different types of systems. And so eventually what we build and with what we try to put together as digital twin platforms has to be deciphered by these operators and engineers, and it has to have their feedback in terms of thresholds that we have to set, in terms of how we can best optimize the system, what is the effect of our actions, all of this comes from them. And to be able to talk to them, we need to have quantifiable metrics of the performance of the system. So we work on tools called the value of information, where we try to tell them what is the benefit of using monitoring tools on your system, how much can you get out of this in monetary terms, so they can actually trust these types of methodologies. And we also work on tools that are helpful for them to uh, deploy in their management of their assets. For example, using previous works and results from the project Threvi, now we're working in the European project Recharge on ontologies of infrastructure systems. Ontologies are basically uh, constructs that can be used as bases, databases, where you have interconnections of basic 
descriptions actually of basic infrastructure platforms. For example, you have a bridge, it is an assembly of different assets, or you have a highway network, it's an interconnection of bridges and tunnels and uh, pathways. These are all described in an ontology that should give you also the interconnection of these systems and eventually also feed processing algorithms that can compute reliability metrics, risk assessment metrics, or re resilience metrics. So this is uh, a bit of what is going on in trying to close the link between the expert and uh, the engineers or the people who are actually doing the uh, indicators of the condition. We have a validated example of that in our collaboration with the Swiss Federal Railways. We use um, the information we get from a diagnostic vehicle. In this case, you see an indicator that would come from such a vehicle. Um, here it's not dynamic measurements, it's measurements of uh, subsidence and an indicator that comes from that, deflection of the track basically. It turns out that this indicator is linked to the condition of the substrate. It can even be used to understand if there's moisture in the ballast. Empirically it has been linked to this. So up to now it, uh, there are some thresholds that are used by the uh, SBB, let's say, operator so that they can decide on whether they should maintain or repair a track, to what extent should they do that and what not. And we tried to build um, a framework, a decision support framework, that can use this indicator, treat it as partial information because it's an uncertain indicator, and then devise an optimal strategy for these operators to follow uh, by solving the problem as a partially observable Markov decision problem. So this is a way to treat sequential decision-making tasks and can tell you in a specific horizon Given that I measure this indirect um, value, what does this mean about the state of my system? There are some details that I won't show you. We try to fuse model-based approaches and reinforcement learning to solve this problem. But practically what it means is if I'm taking this diagnostic vehicle and I have an observation from it, then I can actually get some sort of estimate of what my belief is about the condition of the track and correspondingly uh, act on it so that I can minimize the costs in a, a, a foreseeable horizon that is relevant to the SBP in this case. And the very last thing I would like to leave you with, the last layer of augmentation, is a taking this information and lifting it up to the system's level. And in our group, the best way in which we found to treat interconnected systems, here the ontologies I showed before are very le relevant because that's how you put them together, is to use graph-based approaches. For example, here we tried to model the Madrid Ring Road network, which is a traffic network, as a graph, uh, in this case a random forest type of approximated graph, that shows interconnectivities between components in the network, such as the tunnel, bridges, or the highway that is attached to it. It uses a model of traffic information, and it essentially admits different types of inputs, like the rain flow, maybe an instance of a cyber attack in the network, and it gives you uh, estimates of what would be a good policy, or what is the predicted, actually, uh, flow. Uh, of the traffic in the network so that you can then feed the policy as to how to close the roads or best handle such situations. We do something similar also for wind farms. Again, the farms are systems of wind turbines, and we try to see if we can use graph neural networks to interconnect these wind turbines and to build a model that would predict the performance of a wind farm configuration that doesn't exist yet, but because we have trained it on previously seen configurations, we can actually predict for a new geometry of a farm what would be critical quantities of interest. The production of power, the fatigue load at the level of the individual turbines, and whatnot. Of course, this can work up to some degree sufficient, if sufficient data is there uh, to inform such uh, structures. But what we claim is that a graph-based representation is a natural and intuitive way to do this. So to close, I would like to leave you with these four levels of augmentation that are not only specific to civil engineering, actually, but to anyone who attempts to holistically describe a framework where you have data and where you would like to be able to build a prediction for an operating system. So we have the data physics, the expert in the loop, and ecosystems augmentation. With this, I will close and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very encompassing talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so I think there's many interesting directions. Who wants a first question? Otherwise, I will start with one. So um, 
uh, if I understood it correctly, you, you many examples contained this idea of projecting a high dimensional PDE into a low dimensional space. Mm -hmm. um, w what's your experience with that? So it probably works somehow, but um, it, it also you lose the, the insight. So is it not better instead of let's say taking the wind turbine blade mm. and just say it's a two-body model, which I can explain to everybody and Th then that's say... That's also a projection to a lower space. Is that the same thing? Uh, depends, right? So this is also a reduced order model, what you described. That has to be somehow trained. It has to have the appropriate uh, parameters, masses and distribution of stiffnesses and whatnot, or rigidity, so that it can ad adequately capture the problem. Actually, we also use this kind of a, an approach. I guess the con what you want to contrast it against is a projection-based approach, like what yeah, I showed. SVD. And this depends. So, for instance, the very good thing about uh, the way in which we apply the SVD here, no, uh, an SVD is like a PCA. It could be seen as a linearization of the system. But one has to be careful. We're only linearizing in terms of the parameters. The behavior of the system continues to remain nonlinear which is a great strength. Uh, we still have a nonlinear reduced equation that follows the problem. That for us, for certain uh, problems that have to do with structural mechanics, is very, very efficient. We don't use it so much on fluids, for example. And I don't know if you have their experience. Maybe there, there, there have been shown, these kinds of approaches have been shown to work. This and proper generalized decomposition, I would say. But of course, there are pitfalls that you have to be careful of. There exist phenomena, also in our case, chaotic phenomena that you cannot claim to capture just by these uh, reductions. So you have to be aware of what is the range and the confidence in the prediction, which is why to, we try to also deliver this, these confidence intervals that, you, show, that you, you saw we had in the plot. Because there can exist instances of errors that are maybe detrimental uh, for the kind of design you're trying to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to be aware of the range of uh, applicability of these methods. And uh, that's why I would always attach them to these kinds of error metrics and not just use them deterministically and hope for the best prediction, which can be dangerous. I guess it may be what you have in mind as well. And for my problem, I haven't tried yet, but we will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Anya? <laughs> Uh, that you know your goal, why you have that digital twin, like you want to only detect whether there is a crack or not. Would yeah. it be also an option to reduce your model from not everything everywhere, but yeah. only that part needed for your particular goal? Yeah, yeah, of course. If you're very confident that some specific and narrow indicators su are sufficient, then it's more efficient to build these narrow indicators. If you only want detection of damage, for instance, there is no reason to do a full-blown uh, digital twin, like I showed. You're absolutely right. The usefulness of these twins, however, are there for the cases where things happen that you don't anticipate yeah, yeah. and don't comply with your expectation. Uh, but of course, the definition of the and framing of the problem should depend on the type of uh, challenge you have to work with. Mm -hmm. So also what I showed in the beginning is not useless. There is a lot we can do with data alone and sometimes it's even sufficient. But when you want to go a step further, there's some further knowledge you have to somehow re seed into the system to rely on it. And that's where this becomes useful. Mm -hmm. Completely dependent on your, uh, on your objectives, though, as you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would need to somehow be attentive to the whole system yeah. still, but uh, and detect if there is something appearing here or there, and, mm -hmm. and try to focus on a where now you already identified the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For instance, what you're saying is actually very relevant. Sometimes for us as well, it's not practical to have the whole turbine simulated. If a hotspot location, for instance, is at the connection piece of a tower or in the bottom where the foundation is, we will do what we call a substructuring approach. Basically, we cut the system, we throw away the part that we don't use, and the rest we model more uh, in, in greater detail, uh, usually. I'm interested in this, uh, in this PCA question that mm -hmm. you had. So would it be of interest for you if the loading vectors would be sparse so that you could pinpoint two specific components of your original system? Yes. Now, the loading vectors, uh, let's say the parameter, we, are, we have to have parameters that are sparse. 
I can I would not like to condition a very long <laughs> on a very long vector. So, for example, I showed you I said we I didn't show the details, but I said that our load is an earthquake in that problem. Maybe it's a wind. It doesn't matter so much. That load, it turns out, can be defined uh, in terms of its temporal and spectral characteristics by only two independent variables. So what I'm conditioning on, on is only two variables, and other, or otherwise it would be very hard to enforce this kind of a framework. I'm not conditioning on the whole time history of that load, just to give you an example. Mm -hmm. And if it, was, if it was wind, maybe I would fit the chimal spectrum, and I would say the parameters are the parameters needed to reproduce the spectrum that describes that uh, wind time history, for example. Because I need to have a sparse uh, vector to condition on. If there's another representation you have that would yield a sparse vector, also very useful probably to, for us to, to examine. Were you thinking something like this, the parametrization of the load, or sparsifying its representation? So I was thinking specifically when you do a PCA, because that's what you mentioned, yeah. right? you, you project, and uh, so your PCs would be linear combinations of your data, which is the input? Yes, but be careful, and not linear combinations for the response, because in the end, the response passes from a non-linear reduced order model. Only the dependence on the parameters is, a, is succeeded with the PCA, and that's exactly. in the but naive case, either nearest neighbor or linear combinations. We did it with the VAE, so mm -hmm. it's a non-linear autoencoder that tries to take. There's also non-linearity there at the end of the day for us. Okay, okay, but the, the still the question is if these PCs, if yeah. sparsity in the PCs would give you like a feature extraction, yeah. would that be helpful for if you? It very not? much, and also not only for the loads, also for the responses. Okay. It would be very helpful. And sometimes we try to do that. Instead of using, we try to condition, for example, not on physical parameters like stiffness, but if you have a monitored system and you know you measure the acceleration, instead of using the stiffness as conditioning parameter, you can, you can say, I take the spectral representation of the problem and I take the first three peaks as the mm -hmm. features that define the properties. Mm -hmm. That is one way to do it, which we try as well. Okay. Thanks. That, yeah. was, that was my question. But it was a very good, very yeah. targeted question. Yeah, we have, because we're working in this area, yeah. we have false discovery rate controlled uh -huh. you know, uh, way to get these sparse, the few ones that are relevant. The features that are defining. Yeah, yeah. 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 Actually, I, we're, I didn't maybe, show maybe it maybe here, here, but I can send you something if you're interested. Yeah, That's precisely on that. Thanks. And thanks for the great talk. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Maybe a bit a less technical, more philosophical one. Yes. <laughs> so I think you also have digital twin in your title. I also work on digital twins. And the idea somehow conveyed is always that you have this one model which goes along with a product for the whole life cycle yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but then a lot of the things you're doing, others are doing, seems like it's a solution for a specific problem, right? So you have yeah, one but question, through the basically. life cycle, hopefully, still. Uh, maybe for longer <laughs> things. But the question is, so is there something like a lifetime model which you can independently of the purpose... Can oh, independently of the ob object that you're so monitoring. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make sense to talk <laughs> about something like that. So. Ooh, that's a nice question. Yes, let me take you uh, now to something I didn't show. And it, what is called population-based SHM. And in population-based SHM, the principle is that maybe we can build models of systems that have some similarities, but are not entirely similar. So, for example, in what I showed, I discussed, okay, let's try to do a twin for a turbine and let's make it flexible so the parameters of the turbine can change. Up to that point, I can do. But if now <laughs> you try to learn on a turbine and then try to predict uh, a win uh, the um, wing of an aircraft, and normally it's not possible with what I showed. However, in population-based SHM, we're interested in finding some similarities between a wind turbine blade and the aircraft of, wind of uh, the wing of an aircraft, and try to see if we can actually extrapolate to that level, to basically go towards what you mentioned, twins that are not so specifically tied to the object that is being monitored, and that could learn maybe from multiple monitored objects that share some similarities. Um, and for, my, for me, this is quite exciting. I don't yet have something very nice to show on it, but I hope that this is one of the next things uh, to show. 
this kind of extrapolation. Of course, you cannot promise to do this very confidently and for anything, that's the point. But maybe it can be, done, it can be made to work for some systems that share similarities, even if they're not the same structure. No. Thanks for your take. Do we have further questions? That seems not to be the case then. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. For your very interesting talk. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thing.